Okay, so CNO said, bring the heat on me. It's pretty hot outside. <laughs> and I feel the heat in here already. In fact, as I look out at this group, I can just kind of feel on this poor little Marine up here, all the uh, brain activity that's going around with all this intellectual activity here on me. So I'm sure somehow when you put together all this intellectual activity, these brain waves do cause more heat focused at one spot. And I'm sure there's been some research done on that already. And yeah, I see, thank you, sir, for the hand, the thumbs up in the back. So CNO, you're right, yeah, they're bringing the heat already. But uh, first thing I'd like to say is I'd like to uh, uh, thank all of you for, uh, for being here in attendance and, uh, and coming here and, and joining with us as we talk about uh, where we're trying to head. Uh, you are our strategic advantage, and there's no question in my mind about that. And what I mean by that, I see really two strategic advantages we have, is all of you that are here in the audience today, and the other one, would I would say, is our service members that come from small towns, big cities from across this great country, from this free-thinking society that understands technology and can use this in ways that we don't see anyone, any military around the world do like they do. So you truly are the strategic advantage that we have along with those uh, young service members. Uh, I'd like to first thank uh, Rear Admiral Han, my good friend and partner, uh, Dave, for pulling this together. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank um, the co-sponsors here, the, uh, um, uh, the Asso Association for uh, Naval Engineers. And thank you for all you do and all we've seen you do throughout our careers to get the, uh, the Navy and Marine Corps uh, a much better capability to the warfighter. Uh, General Dunford uh, testified just last month, and one of the things he said that if we don't change the trajectory we're on right now, then we're gonna be, high, be behind um, and at a disadvantage within five years. And question whether we may even be having difficulty projecting power across the globe. Now that ought to get, uh, get our, everyone's attention. And we, I think, in the Marine Corps feel that as things are changing out there throughout the environment that we're in with our, with our adversaries and the way technology is changing. We feel that, but to hear the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff state that, then we truly go, yep, that's a wake-up call. We need to keep moving. And I think that's the advantage that uh, we've got uh, working with you here. And I think there's certainly widespread agreement that uh, we've got to move faster. We've got to change that tra to trajectory. Um, the good news is it's acknowledged throughout DOD uh, and certainly, I think, uh, with, throughout Congress. Uh, in the NDAA uh, in 16 and the National Defense Authorization Act in 17, they gave us lots of uh, help to be able to move faster and accelerate things uh, and get on a faster tra trajectile uh, trajectory that uh, General Dunford uh, was uh, alluding to. Um, one of the things I would say on that is they can give us the law, but we've got a lot of bureaucratic process uh, within DOD. And that's the part that I think now we're really starting to attack. How do we take the provisions that are in the law and be able to change we are organized and operate to go faster? And we're attacking that. We're attacking it hard and we're, we've got a lot of congressional support to go after. One of the clear things I see is just as the CNO was up here, uh, the service chiefs being able to have more authority and more responsibilities in the acquisition process. Uh, as we went through that with the Commandant, we're starting to learn what that means. And the service chiefs are starting to understand that as I watch the CNO, the Commandant, General Milley, General Goldfein, as they take that on, they are starting to understand what that is and it's causing um, us to move faster. There's no question about that. Um, so I think the rapid acquisition processes are having uh, their intent, uh, but I still think the fundamental question that we really have to have is we want to go faster, is how do we validate those capabilities or those requirements we have before we can go faster? If you can't validate that, the process will slow you down. So the key thing that I really want to focus on today is alignment. Alignment with all of you with where we're trying to head because the more aligned we can get with you, 
the easier it will be to speed the process up, and I'll try to touch on some of that. Um, that alignment needs to come with our concepts, our capability gaps, and our priorities, along with all of the in industry, the scientists, the researchers, engineers, our combat developers, and our operators. So bringing that team together and aligning that earlier in the process is what's going to allow us to change that trajectory and to go faster. Uh, after 15 years for the Marine Corps being in Iraq and Afghanistan on the land, uh, and really in a lot of ways having our heads down to what other competitors or adversaries are doing around the globe. As we came out of that and started to look to reset to what our, really our Title 10 mission is, to be that ready force to come from the sea with the United States Navy, Navy uh, to be an amphibious force projected around the globe, uh, to be able to bring joint forcible entry capability, we realized that a lot of the capabilities we needed, we don't have. The world has changed, technology's changed, and we're behind the power curve on that. So as we looked at that, uh, a lot of intellectual effort has gone into that with the Navy and the Marine Corps, developing concepts, starting to develop the capabilities. They're gonna allow us to operate where General Dumford said, we're gonna be able to project power into the future. And that are some of the things that I think that, uh, that we're gonna have to work on today. So for the Marine Corps to be with the Navy, those shock troops from the sea, the inside force, the forward deployed force, to be the first ones on the scene, to be able to enable the joint force, there's gonna be a lot of work that we're gonna have to do into the future. Um, this is not something that's different. We've been through here throughout our history. And I think if you read The Art of War and Sun Tzu, he looks and says that the genius of the military is military formations being like water, ever-changing, being agile, being adaptable, so we continue to change by looking at what the threat is. And that, I think, is at the strategic inflection point we're at today, is looking at who we are, what we've been doing over the last 15 years, and going back to our ability to integrate and fight to and from the sea with the United States Navy, and how do we get after that. Um, as I said, we've had this challenge before. Many times today now, people are starting to challenge with the threats that are out there, or whether the Navy and Marine Corps team are gonna be able to project power across the globe, and certainly for the Marine Corps from an amphibious standpoint, which is our Title X responsibilities. So as we look at that, we've been there before. And we go back, and I'll give you a couple examples. As the Marines came out of World War I, uh, we looked real hard at where our mission was going to be in the future. Was it gonna be as a continental land army, like we had fought in World War I, or was it gonna be back with the Navy and operating from the sea? And as we looked at the threats and we saw the environment changing in the Pacific and the Japanese threat, we went back to what we, were, we had always been, a naval force. Uh, and as we went through that challenge, the Marines who looked at that challenge, they learned a lot of lessons from what they learned in, in World War I. And one of the things that they learned was that one of the first battles, one of our famous battles we had in France, Bellu Wood, was when the Germans were on this wood that had been in there, dug in, very defended, and the Marines had to attack across this vast wheat fields. They learned a lesson in there as they looked at that, and as they applied that to the Pacific, they viewed the wood as an island and the wheat fields is the sea. And they learned that they can't just assault straight into that without maneuver and fires. And so as they went through that process, we had a Lieutenant Victor Krulak that was forward in China at the time, in Shanghai, and he was looking at uh, operations uh, with the Japanese Naval Infantry. And he was taken by the landing craft that they had developed, the Japanese Navy had developed, that could protect their infantry, it could move in rapidly, it had a big uh, door that would open, they could get off very quickly, it had a propeller that was inside a tunnel so it could get up close to the beach and get out of there rapidly. So General, or, uh, Victor Krulak at that point went back, he built a balsa model out of that, he took it to his leadership, the leadership said get down to uh, uh, Louisiana, there's a guy down there that we think is building stuff uh, down in the Louisiana uh, swamp area, 
and he got down there with a guy named Andrew Higgins. And Andrew Higgins and Krulak got together and developed the landing craft that we use so successively throughout the Pacific and also throughout uh, Europe uh, in a lot of the landing operations we did. If you roll the clock forward, again, they were questioning whether we could conduct amphibious operations uh, after World War II with a lot of the weapons that had been proliferating, nuclear warfare capabilities. And the Marines again looked at this and said, there's got to be another way to approach the problem. And we looked at vertical assault as another way to improve our capability to, uh, to conduct amphibious landings. And so again, at that point, Lieutenant Colonel Krulak now went to Quant was at Quantico assigned to Naval Schools Command, the predecessor of the command that I come from, uh, Marine Corps Combat Development Command, and he brought in a guy named Igor Sikorsky. And they took the helicopter, and you could see where that has taken us today, all the way today with the capability we've got with our MV-22 Ospreys. So it's that partnering with you out here with what our concepts and our ideas are going to be are, I think, what is going to truly make us uh, successful into the future. Um, and so they, I th again, today I say that that is you, the ones that are going to help us. And with that, I think it's important as we talk about where we're trying to head, the concepts really drive where we're going. And I'll, I'll kind of move into this a little bit more, but we are a concepts-based requirement system. Our concepts drive our requirements, which drive our capabilities. So I want to show you a video on the Marine Corps operating concept. The CNO, the, I saw some of his graphs, and I couldn't explain his graphs, but maybe the Marines can show you a movie. You can sit back and eat some popcorn and enjoy the movie that we'll show you. So if you can go ahead and play the Marine Corps operating concept video, please. For the last two decades, U.S. forces have enjoyed an asymmetric advantage over enemy forces due to quality personnel, superior technology, greater logistics capabilities, unchallenged air superiority, uncontested sea control, and an unfettered ability to command and control. However, our current and future adversaries have been challenging or erasing our advantage. The Marine Corps Operating Concept, or MOC, is the starting point to address this problem by reaffirming the primacy of maneuver warfare and combined arms for the 21st century and identifying the critical tasks to develop the future force. Its purpose is to describe how the Marine Corps will operate, fight, and win in 2025 and beyond, and to shape our actions as we design and develop the capabilities and capacity of the future force. Through a combined arms approach that embraces information warfare as indispensable, it achieves complementary effects as it executes maneuver warfare across all domains. The Marine Corps is embarked upon a significant transition, turning the corner for more than a decade of continuous war in Iraq and Afghanistan to focus our attention on the threats and opportunities that will define the future character of war and the means we will need to prevail. Fighting at sea, from the sea and ashore, it operates as an integrated part of the naval force and the larger combined joint force. Our preparation for the inevitable conflicts of the future begins with this operating concept. It charts how we will transform ourselves to deter and defeat the threats of tomorrow and will look something like this. The following vignettes, based on a fictional scenario in 2025, in a notional area of operations, illustrate many of the key concepts found in the mock. The MU was about halfway through a deployment conducting theater security cooperation missions. Mobile training teams were on the ground with local defense forces instructing and demonstrating basic tactics. At the same time, they were gaining insights on local culture and politics and feeding this information back to Intel for inputting into deep learning predictive analysis decision support tools that could be used for future operations. Assessment of the environment identified a growing threat in the region with designs on overthrowing the local government. As the situation deteriorated, the MITs pulled back to the ships and the MU began planning for their next mission. During this time, a hostile hybrid force with advanced weapons and ISR overthrew the local government, posing an immediate threat to the sea line of communication. 
The Argmu was tasked to secure an expeditionary forward position on an island inside the enemy's threat ring. Sensors and decoys had been left in key locations to prep the environment for future conflict. The intent was to establish a sensor line to get a better read on signatures and movements, deny the enemy's ability to maneuver in the littoral, and strike targets deep inland. It helped that the island had a decent patch of paved road to use to arm and refuel aircraft. Unmanned underwater vehicles conducted hydrographic survey and identified potential landing areas, while unmanned aircraft surveyed the entire area looking for threats and opportunity. A deception drew attention to alternate islands to confound the enemy. Low signature unmanned undersea and surface vehicles conducted multi-domain reconnaissance in the days prior, providing critical details on the tides and beach area. A local intranet, ComNet, was established using a UAS to ensure comms throughout the operations, as it was certain the enemy would attack in the cyber domain. A rifle company raid came in from over the horizon on a zero illumination night with small boats and fighting connectors. Additional unmanned swarming boats provided flank security for the raid force and served as launch platforms for small UAS. It was a high risk windward side landing with poor beaches and multiple breakers. But an unmanned undersea swarm equipped with relative navigation and beacons guided the company to the landing site in spite of the conditions and degraded GPS. Once ashore, rough terrain and degraded GPS challenged the platoon's maneuver to the objective area. However, basic skills in night land navigation with map and compass enabled the platoons to get into position before dawn. Working from F-35 ISR feeds, the support by fire positions suppressed enemy targets while kinetic swarming unmanned aircraft systems launched from the loitering unmanned boats provided additional support. At the same time, the maneuver element, supported with electric-powered vehicles, isolated the area and used unmanned systems to maneuver through the complex to secure the objective. By mid-morning, the expeditionary forward operating site was established and ISR, strike, and air operations were underway. Employing the forward expeditionary capabilities from an expeditionary advanced base, along with the float forces, enabled the naval force to prep the environment, take the initiative from the enemy, and set conditions for entry operations. As additional forces closed into the operating area, a deliberate assault was planned to defeat the hybrid force, which had occupied a littoral urban area. The plan called for two task forces to assault vertically, while two other battalion task forces assaulted on the surface with small boats, fighting long-range, high-capacity connectors and armored vehicles. Once again, unmanned systems paved the way, conducting beach and deep reconnaissance, while the MAGTAF dynamically tasked and retasked the available unmanned and manned ISR capabilities. Unmanned amphibious vehicles and small boats provided launch platforms for fires and obstacle and mine breaching. Units coming across the beach used numerous small landing sites and emphasized speed and dispersion, finding gaps in the enemy defenses. They did have to contend with hasty mines and hasty obstacles, but used their unmanned assault vehicles equipped with breaching capabilities, like UAS with explosive charges, were employed to detect and overcome the obstructions. Units coming by air used multiple LZs versus a single large one, inserting away from the actual objectives to disguise their intent and present a tougher targeting problem for massed enemy fires. As these multiple small units began maneuvering, the networking and common situational awareness provided by next-generation handheld radios and tablets ensured leaders were able to maintain tempo in this fluid environment. Each battalion was giving a sector in a densely populated area and tasked to defeat the enemy and support local forces, rooting out hybrid proxy forces intermingled with the locals. Auto recognition sensors on various platforms received cueing from and then fed back into the same intelligence decision support systems, providing assistance in predicting where the enemy was likely to appear and then helping to distinguish them from the population. 
The smaller units not only had more organic combined arms capabilities, like Group 1 UAS munitions, EW, and ISR, they also had the connectivity to reach out for almost every capability in the joint force. And more importantly, they had already trained with it. The squad leaders and platoon commanders employed assets and capabilities that only a few years ago resided only at battalion, regiment, and brigade levels. Utilizing real-time ISR, an expeditionary command and control network, and precision fires provided an effective way to engage the enemy kinetically in a complex urban environment. Small UASs with custom 3D printed warheads provided lethal effects, but explosive yields appropriate for the urban environment. However, non-lethal capabilities are absolutely critical for certain situations, like controlling and moving crowds without escalating hostilities. On the non-kinetic side, you have to sense and make sense of social media patterns while fighting the constant battle for the narrative. The mock guides are collective efforts to ensure the Marine Corps' future readiness and relevancy. The Marine Corps must be a tailorable, flexible, and versatile force capable of responding to any crisis across the full range of military operations. The Marine Corps must be a coherent and fully integrated naval force that can contribute to deterrence, provide maritime security, perform sea control, and project power ashore to impose our will upon adversaries. We must be an expeditionary force that is trained and equipped and able to operate in austere conditions and hostile environments. We must be an agile force that can navigate the physical and cognitive dimensions of complex situations and seize the initiative. We must be a lethal force with a 21st century approach to combined arms that integrates information warfare and seeks to destroy and defeat our enemies across five domains. Through this approach, the Marine Corps will be able to adapt, innovate, and overcome a rapidly changing and chaotic security environment. So looking at the video again, I think the key thing here is this is what's driving us. When the Commandant signed the Marine Corps operating concept last fall, this became the synthesizing force to bring the entire force together on where we're driving into the future. So the campaign of learning that we have with our 12 warfighting challenges uh, is driving uh, not only Sea Dragon 2025, which is our experimentation effort, but it's also driving Marine Corps Force 2025 which is the new force that the Marine Corps is building. Uh, just this last year, Congress upped us by 3,000 uh, from 182,000 Marines to 185,000, and that is part of the Marine Corps Force 2025. We're changing uh, what the Corps looks like to try to drive towards some of the things that we're showing in here. The key part, I think, with working with you is that, again, back to that alignment of if we don't align with you early on, and figure out what's in front of us and what's the art of the possible, we end up putting requests for proposal out in the normal requirements process that then won't meet what industry or research and development can actually do. And then we get into the slow churn that takes a long time, a lot of it in the test process, and a lot of checks and balances that are on top of us. That's what takes so long. If we can align early and see what's the art of the possible out there, and then define our requirements around what is the art of the possible, we can quickly put those requests for proposal out there that then can move the process faster. Uh, one of the things that we just did that I think was uh, very successful was we did a ship to shore maneuver advanced naval technology exercise um, this last end of April and May out at Camp Pendleton with our Navy partners. Over the last year, this is an example of how to align better what we did was we brought together industry, uh, our warfare centers, a lot of academia to try to help solve the problem. We had about three uh, one-week workshops trying to go over our concept to show them what we're trying to do, where we're trying to head. And then in April, we brought them together out of Camp Pendleton, and we had about 100 different tech demonstrations out there to see what the art of the possible is. And we had the Commandant out there, we had the Secretary of Navy out there, Secretary Stackley, 
And I think as you looked at the demonstration at the end, you could see from where the video was trying to take us. It was out in front of you, you could visualize it and start to see that th this is possible. We can move in these directions to start maneuvering in different ways uh, across those five domains. So I think that's an example of how we can uh, move faster uh, within that. Um, the Commandant in, in his uh, Frago to advance the con contact has tasked me with developing a fifth generation Marine Corps. And as I started looking at that, I wasn't really sure what fifth generation, I know what F-35 is, it's a fifth generation aircraft. Uh, and I look at that as, yep, it's precision, it's stealth, that should be a given in a fifth generation aircraft. But really it's, it's sensing, it's uh, unequaled processing power, it's ability to fuse information and data in a simple way and then be able to pass that around the battle space. If I look at that as fifth gen and I look across the Marine Corps, there are areas that we've got fifth generation capabilities. There's a lot of areas where we don't have fifth generation capabilities. And trying to knock down those areas on where we don't have those capabilities is where we need to go. Just earlier this week I was out, we're doing some testing on putting some active protection systems onto our tanks. And I was out there looking what industry had out there and I was very pleased with what I see on our aircraft today, our high tech aircraft, that we can put those same type of sensing and defensive systems on uh, our ground vehicles and moving with the Army in that direction, bringing that technology in, using that to defeat anti-guided tank missiles, rocket propelled uh, grenades, those sort of things. But really what got my attention though was not so much the technology of defeating that threat, it was how would the Marines use this differently on tomorrow's battlefield. And the first thing I looked at was those tanks now or those vehicles that would all have this capability would now have radar sensing capabilities on them that could sense, make sense out there and share that information. So once that tank took on a weapon, sensed it, defeated it, it also is figuring out the exact point of origin from that threat and then able to pass that information throughout its formation and also across the battle space. So that enemy or adversary that pops his head up to fire, it isn't just defeating the threat, it's not we defeat a missile with a capability, it's we quickly figure out where that came from and what I found was uh, talking to the Marines out there, it would bring out a much more offensive capability when we're actually bringing a defensive capability to bear. So I think that's just one example of how uh, the technology can change not only the, the capability we bring, but how we use that capability in completely innovative ways. So just in conclusion, I would say is, is you, you can see where we're at, uh, where we're trying to head, we certainly need your help. You are the experts out here, and as I look out here, you know, I see a lot of our, our uh, service members here, Marines and Sailors, who are our next Lieutenant Krulax? Who from industry and research and our engineers and academia, who are the ones that are the next Andrew Higgins? Who are the next Igor Sikorskis that can help us take visions that I just presented here today to help us with that alignment to get on the trajectory that General Tunford uh, is, is told us that we need to get on, otherwise we're not gonna stay competitive in the future world. So with that, again, I thank you. And